Welcome back to a new episode of Making Sense of Web3 and Crypto, uh, Life Itself. And we're continuing our in-depth exploration of these topics. Uh, as people know, Web3 has become a massive phenomenon with very bold claims made about its potential impact, claims that go far beyond classic technology boosterism to claims for the radical transformation and improvement of our econo economies and our societies. At the same time, there's a lot of debate about those claims, and even on basic points and definitions. And this is a really you know, controversial and even polarizing topic with strong pro and anti camps. Now, this series is about how we make sense of what is going on and to evaluate some of these claims and uh, assertions. And we start by exploring specific hopes and aspirations that are associated with ideologies. And we also invite expert guests to come and discuss with us uh, from all sides of the spectrum. And one final point I want to emphasize about our approach is that just like retweets don't imply endorsement, we're really trying to bring in different perspectives. And even for ourselves here, um, myself, the host and, and life itself, to put forward the best version of any particular position, whether it's one we agree with or don't agree with, in a sense, whether we evaluate it as true or false, we want to steel man it. And that's the key point of this series. So don't say that what we're always saying means we agree with it. And I'm really pleased today and privileged to have with us Stephen Reed rejoining. He's the teacher of how to DAO, tools for the regenerative renaissance and the promise of decentralization. And he's a member of a not-for-profit worker cooperative, the Dandelion Collective, where he leads the development of the Dandelion platform. And previously, he founded the Psychedelic Society and served as the youngest ever board member of Greenpeace UK. And finally, Stephen has an emphasis in physics from the University of Oxford, where he specialized in quantum field theory, and he's got an MRes in complexity sciences from the University of Bristol. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you yes. for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, well, I was thinking we kick off today to follow up. We did have a cool, like our first uh, episode on this, like quite a few months ago. And one of the things I really wanted to follow up with from that was to talk a bit more about cooperatives, worker cooperatives specifically, mm. and DAOs and Web3, which is, I know, something that you're really interested in. Um, and also something I'm, I'm really interested in, uh, certainly very interested in worker cooperatives. So I'd love to, maybe you could start out by telling me what is like, well, first of all, what is a worker cooperative and how do you see uh, Web3 and DAOs kind of being valuable in relation to that area? Yeah, a worker cooperative is an organization that is uh, owned and run by its workers where uh, profits are either, uh, reinvested into the business or distributed amongst the, the worker owners. Uh, crucially, there aren't external shareholders that, that benefit from the profits that arguably, I know, the workers themselves are creating. Um, uh, yeah, as you mentioned in the intro that I, I work with for uh, a not-for-profit worker cooperative, and I find it to be an, an enormously nourishing part of my, my life to, to work in this way. It, feel, it feels in, in many ways much more like a, a family than it, than it does working in a traditional uh, for-profit hierarchical organization. Uh, my experience is that, yeah, uh, these organizations require uh, just an extremely high, <laughs> level of, of of care and and compassion over and above what many people are used to in their their work lives to function effectively but with that care and compassion absolutely they, they can work well great so it's, so just to, to summarize essentially the worker cooperative which is different from most is that it's essentially fully owned by its it, the people working in it, it doesn't have mm -hmm. external shareholders and as i understand it then normally that ownership the, the two parts of ownership, the economic ownership, i.e. the rights over any surplus, mm -hmm. are almost roughly normally equally uh, divided. So like one, one, one member, one vote or mm -hmm. one share. And similarly, kind of governance control is also roughly democratic normally. Like, again, one member, one vote or like one, one. It, there can be some variation. Yeah, my, my, exactly. My most commonly, it's one member, one vote and, uh, and a kind of roughly equal distribution of of profits, although that, that's not necessarily the case, yeah. It's not necessarily the case. So, and, you know, from my understanding, these have, you know, a long history, at least back to, um, you know, Robert uh, Owen, 
the uh, you know the beginning of the corporate movement in the, the early 19th century and obviously the aspiration i think could go further back in history clearly to share people who were and what you know one thing maybe to remark is my understanding also that they're relatively rare like i was actually reading a book about this recently and that relative to consumer co-ops which people might be familiar with like many people have cooperative supermarkets that they mm -hmm. go and buy food at um most countries have one i think the statistic this person was citing who was a big fan of co-ops was that in 2008 and this is a bit older but 120 million people in the united states were members of co-ops however uh and this would probably be an underestimate but still no there were only 300 worker cooperative businesses in the united states so there was this kind of like 120 million people were members of consumer or credit co-ops but there's quite a small number of worker co-ops mm -hmm. before we come to dallas it might be just like what what mm. do you think are the challenges that people face around because you know work co-op sounds amazing like it you know as you said less hierarchy no bosses you know people get to participate um mm -hmm. no kind of not the unfairness that we see often in capitalism um at multiple levels what what stands in the way in your view traditionally of working corps being more successful yeah so three things come to mind firstly i think it's uh it's just that they're not they're not very well known <laughs> lots of people don't even really know that it's a possibility uh we're, we're, we're so used to um to, to capitalism and kind of like you know in shareholder ownership structures that most entrepreneurs are just that head in that direction and are more interested in you know taking VC funding and all the rest of it than contemplating how they could actually just come together with with, with motivated peers to, to bring that idea to life in a, uh, in a different way uh, another aspect of it is, is capital that and kind of related to what I just said like um, it's co-ops of all kinds including work co-ops have for some years now we've only much trickier to to raise capital given that um there aren't of course like uh, there is an equity that you can you can promise to to investors in the same way and uh, and finally possibly the most um important certainly the most interesting to me is just like it's it that it's hard work <laughs> or it's like it's to to exist within a worker cooperative it requires like just you know a different uh skill set if you like to the uh to working in a command and control organization where like you there are great benefits to following orders and if we like to be um, a bit cheeky saying you know sucking up to superiors and you know that kind of thing and um worker cops require the, the workers to to have excellent interpersonal and, and and like and relational skills i would suggest above and beyond that which you might find or might be ne really necessary in in uh, most traditional companies that's great summary and i think just, so i recap it is one just not so well known but maybe the most the two actual kind of practical ones are harder to raise capital because you can't have equity share you can't give out equity to non participant non non worker non participatory members but capital providers mm -hmm. um, and third which you said is the most interesting the most important maybe is that it's it's kind of hard it takes a kind of um maybe more effort but also more uh how do i say more development in the being but you know greater maybe a greater level of consciousness if you could put it on participants for it to function well but when it does function well it's amazing that's i think that's really interesting and i want to draw out something on that that i think we're going to keep mm -hmm. coming back to in maybe in this episode but also around this whole discussion about web3 and crypto that i want to label um d the different kinds of solutionism around uh problems that humans have and so let's just take one or prom or, or opportunities but obviously organizing a business how do we uh produce something together mm -hmm. that, i mean if, if i could do things on my own and I could just be a calm to my own. I don't need to form a business. None of these questions come up. But obviously, for most hum many human endeavors uh, of production, we could, if we're going to sound economics about it, I need to come together with others. And maybe also with machines and tools and so on. Mm -hmm. And in this question of how we do that and how we do it well, and we, 
there are these, I suppose, different streams. One is what I would call the technological solution stream, that the way that we solve challenges we have in there, and the challenge might be, how do we um, check, make sure people, everyone contributes, or how do we work out the value that people produced, or how do we uh, monitor just like the, you know, how do we um, decide what work we do? There's a kind of technological route. We have some technology that helps us with that. There's what I would call a structural solutionist route, which is that we create governance structures or some other kind of um, social institutional design that helps with that. And finally, there's what I would call ontological solutionism, which is that we need transformation in our being or we need growth in our ontology, our being for us to, our consciousness, for us to, to, address, to mm. uh, address things. Now, of course, I think in, in any, like in almost any area of interesting human endeavor, all three of those play a role. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the point, though, that I just heard you sort of alluding to, though, was maybe, was that there might be ones that are more or less important. So while everything, technology, structure, and um, ontology, or being, or consciousness play a role, mm -hmm. and any, in any given situation, one might be more important, or might have a primacy, we might yeah. say. And what I heard you saying there was that while... The cooperative design is in a way a structure. It's very much a structural solution. We're going to make sure everyone has equal ownership. Mm -hmm. For that to actually function well, you need this kind of consciousness growth or this or this way of org operating interpersonally. Could you say a bit more about that from your personal experience? Because I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the essence of it is that uh, conflicts happen. <laughs> And uh, in a worker cooperative, you know, there's no one with the authority to just say, well, it's going to be like this, or you're right and you're wrong, or you just like bang your heads together and, and you know, and, and just, you know, get on with it. Um, yeah, it just, it, it, it really, um, the work of, of uh, moving through conflict is, is in my experience, a, a key piece of a functioning worker cooperative. And it's not about avoiding it. It's, it's absolutely about accepting that, like, it, it can and will come up. And very often there are very important creative tensions that, you know, that are, are being brought up by, by conflict in, in the workplace, you know, in a cooperative workplace. And then, uh, so then the question becomes, well, what, you know, how can we productively work with and through conflict? And uh, that has been a, a key area of, of interest and focus for, for Dandelion Collective these, since we actually officially became a worker cooperative a few years ago now. And I'm, I'm very pleased to say I think we've developed some, some very good practices around um, and, and processes around first encouraging people if, if you do notice there's any kind of charge with another individual in the organization to like, uh, reach out to them at the earliest possible opportunity and just say, hey, I'm kind of feeling this thing, are you feeling this too? And, and just to try to kind of like knock it on the head before it, it balloons. If something has gone past that stage, then uh, we, we suggest that people find, ask a third colleague to, to act as a mediator and to, um, which often, the mediator often doesn't do very much at all. Can I ask a question? Can you? Yeah. I, I, I get this is really amazing. And can you give a one concrete example, if it were okay? I mean, it might be a might be a trivial one, but yeah. can you think of a concrete example illustrating this this conf where conflict has arisen and how it, and how this got worked through, and and what the resolution was? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the, uh, so the last process I participated in uh, conflict resolution I participated in was actually connected to another very interesting set of processes we have in the organization, which is our participatory budgeting process. So another thing that um, is done quite differently in the worker cops, at least our worker cop, is like there's, there's no one, no one in charge to set the budget and say, okay, you get this much money, you get this much money, and so on that. So we have this, this participatory budgeting process where we take all those decisions together. Each member of the co-op gets allocated uh, a certain uh, proportion of the budget, which is uh, in, related to how large a contribution they've made to the organization in the previous quarter as a kind of incentive to, to, you know, to continue making a positive contribution. And then we get, and then people can basically pitch projects. This, I, wanna, I want this much money to do this thing over the next three months. And then we all listen to each other's pitches and then we allocate money to those different pitches. 
So um, there was, uh, well, let me see what's appropriate level of detail to, to offer on this. Um, uh, there was a, so a, a, a colleague that had actually uh, ended up losing money in the quarter, which is quite rare for us. <laughs> generally, generally, people's like because of this process where we are kind of like vetting each other's projects to some degree and then able to kind of mutually support one another. We um, they they're, they're not losing money, but this this has something gone a bit awry um, in this instance, and uh, I had so the, the, the this person had had pitched for a kind of uh contingency fund in case that like in, the, they would they would lose money again in the future and i and a couple of colleagues said no this doesn't really feel right you know like prefer to just make no one else's contingency funds refer to just have projects that you know seem decent in the first place rather than thinking they you know they might screw up and um so that that was like the the substance but then there's all this it's also this aspect that in the in the meeting this person felt like i had spoken over them and i had interrupted them so um i i i i realized this like at the end of the meeting, I was like, well, I think I was a little, you know, I, I did sort of interrupt that person. So I sent a, a voice message to our, our, our WhatsApp group, for uh, which, we, which we try to use as little as possible. We generally use Slack, but WhatsApp we use for kind of important and more personal stuff and sent a voice message saying, just really want to celebrate this person's work. Like they have generally been doing a great job. It was just unfortunate that things didn't really work out for them in this quarter. And I just want to apologize for, for speaking over them. And, um, this... Uh, this person then sent me a message um, and I had the sense that like we were kind of cool at that point and anyway, anyway about like a week later it became clear that this person didn't feel that there was a resolution that hadn't been an adequate resolution in this this situation and this is someone who I work with closely in a number of ways and so um, they they reached out to me and said that they would like a, a mediated conversation and they suggested another one of my colleagues to, um, to, to participate in that so that we could you know, dig a bit more into yeah what had, what had gone on and and the, the fit and people's um, uh, feelings that they you know, still had around this this topic to to seek some deeper resolution. So can I ask, so I, and I and well, I mean I, I hope obviously that it got it got resolved. I guess that might be the, the good outcome. Like what I want to highlight here though, just to, so is that there's a process, um, and just to be clear, I think things like this could go on in any. In, in, in non-cooperative mm -hmm. structures, what I think that I'm hearing, so let, let, what I want to highlight first of all is I want to acknowledge everyone involved in that there's an awareness. Like what I first hear from you, and I know you're telling a story, and I'm not saying you're trying to, but you were kind of self-aware. You had an awareness that something had happened within the meeting. You were taking responsibility. You were proactively reaching out. There's even this process at the beginning that where there is going to be conflict, but pe you, people had spoken up and there'd been a, like some disagreement, but in a constructive way. So what is, what I'm hearing though is in, in the danger, of the, in a kind of a good way, the danger in a co-op, in a worker co-op, is if you don't have this in personal stuff, things can go really awry. Whereas in a normal organization, you could kind of just walk over, you could kind of step over yeah. these kind of resolutions yeah. and you're kind of forced in the worker co-op structure to take action because you're, you're going to work this person, but also there's like a kind of more equal setup. Yeah. Um, and so what I'm trying to get at is that like in a normal business, you could have a meeting where like the boss spoke over someone or someone else. Cause I also get, you're like, I think the founder and you have like, you know, authority, maybe you're one of the founders and have authority and so on. So I'm just really like a acknowledging that, that kind of like the, the, the level of development of like perspective taking that you're doing, the kind of self-awareness, the, the responsibility, but I'm also trying to connect that to the work corp structure and why that's so crucial is that in a normal mm -hmm. company, let's say let's say you quote unquote you're the boss and you spoke over someone they just have to kind of live with it in some way you know it's like it it, it might not be good it might not be a good work environment mm -hmm. but in a way you could kind of get away with it somehow more whereas in a worker corporate environment there's this requirement to take more responsibility and in fact for it to function you need to be able to take this greater responsibility yeah is, is that what i'm getting exactly from? Like the, the whole thing will just grind to a halt if if it, and, and, or will grind to unless people people uh, all, all colleagues in the organization feel respected and feel heard i would suggest and, and that's just um this 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 sense of being respected and heard in, in many traditional organizations is is kind of like it's it's not 
maybe what we describe as essential it's more seen as like a nice to have <laughs> it's like and but there's people people are kind of uh, educated if you like into accepting that sometimes you are going to be spoken over by a, a you know someone of greater authority in the organization and you, and you might not like it and you're just going to have to suck it up and like in, in worker co-ops like there's a at least the ones my, my experience of being a worker co-op is like that you know that's quite different it's not no I'm not going to suck this up like we're going to work it out and we're going to we're going to come to a place of mutual respect you know? wow okay and so what I'm seeing there going back to this point about the structure and the the being because that aspect of like you ju- the point you just made which is that people come to sort of accept that at least in some situations and in some situations maybe most situations people of greater authority will kind of speak over them or not respect them or at least in some situations that will happen that's like an almost ontological like this kind of part of our being or conscious how we see the world and in a way it doesn't have to be that way in any in any uh but in a way that the kind of being and structure kind of reflect each other Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. back and forth probably you know like a certain way of being creates a certain kind of structure that structure reinforces a certain way of being Mm -hmm, we have this kind of mm -hmm. like ecology of structure and being yeah and what you're i hear saying that is that it's not and i think i want to bring this up because i'm going to now to kind of come to how this race to web three and the Mm DAOs and and so on is the danger could be that we could think it was that a kind of one directional causation so if we put in the right structure Mm. then we get the being and mm-hmm. I think what you were even alluding to at the beginning was that's not the case, that they may reflect, they may be in a, um, a self-reinforcing dynamic, mm-hmm. but if you, you just putting in the structure of a like democratic work club does not make everyone wonderfully egalitarian. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wish it were that simple. Yeah. I wish it was the case. Okay. Yeah. But, and, and at the same time, you know, that it does supports encourage things in that direction. Yeah. 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 That's what I'm hearing. It supports it. It demands it. In fact, is what you're saying, because if it doesn't, it will be dysfunctional. I think that's one of the critiques. Mm-hmm maybe a mistaken one of many work corps like oh they become they just stop working you know at some in some world there's some kind of mm-hmm. conflict and you, you revert to a structure where someone has more power than other people and in some very probably quite substantive way mm-hmm. um but that point of this dynamic um because i think sometimes for me and i i'm putting this forward because this you know just to bring us to the next point i want you to kind of respond to it the the danger i see sometimes in the speaking about DAOs, the most positive speaking about DAOs mm-hmm. and Web3 and these distributed autonomous organizations is a bit like that kind of, ma- we're going to magically have a more kind of flat collaborative yeah, structure. Yeah. And because of that, it's we're just going to all sing hands, you know, hold hands and sing come by, you know, John Lennon's Imagine will play on the soundtrack and we'll walk off into the sunset. Mm-hmm. And I think what you, you've said several times, much more complex than that, both whether it's in a work corp or in a DAO. So mm-hmm. I'd like you to kind of talk maybe a bit more to that of like both what you see as the potential in DAOs, because there is mm-hmm. structural that maybe innovation that's useful. Mm-hmm. And also what you think needs to go with it. What is the complementary? Mm, what's, right. the, what's the hamburger in this in the sandwich of the what's the conscious neurontological part that has to go with the structural part to really fulfill o- o- on this? Yeah. Yeah. So first briefly, I just introduced the concepts of, of a multi-stakeholder cooperative. So this is, if you like, a kind of generalized form of worker cooperative where there are several different groups of stakeholders that each might hold differing voting and or economic rights. You, 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 you made, usually made that distinction between voting and, and economic rights previously. And, and interestingly, because um, uh, multi-stakeholder cooperatives uh, can issue um, economic rights to non-worker members, they are, they are finding it a little bit easier to raise capital. And maybe we can come back to that at some stage. But I, I actually, uh, my favorite way of describing DAOs is that DAOs are super scalable blockchain based multi stakeholder cooperatives, at best, at least. <laughs> and um, so uh, let's see, just, just bring up some. Let me, here, just, you can bring yeah, some up. Let me just unpick that for you. So, first of all, I think many listeners will know what a DAO is, but you could think of it as like a corporation on the blockchain or an organization on the blockchain. A distributed, mm-hmm. Originally, they were actually called distributed autonomous corporations. Now, DAX and they're called DAOs, distributed. Mm-hmm. Thomas organization which is a much nicer acronym <laughs> and to, at least to an outsider they would look a lot like uh a, a, an organization with the, instead of shares there are these tokens and the tokens normally have some com- combination of economical voting rights often they have and and by default though they're, all, they're at least 
they tend to be fairly egal like one one token one vote kind of thing sometimes but you can have the whole as within a normal voting structure you can basically mimic a cooperative in the sense you can have a structure where it doesn't matter how many tokens you own you only have like one maybe one at least governance vote there are you know there's quadratic voting there's all kinds of varieties mm. of voting so that's what sort of, i think i'm doing a, a fair summary of a DAO. Yeah. and then you said super scalable multi-stakeholder co-op so yeah so what what talk about about the scalability first what do you what's not scalable about a non a non DAO, a non-blockchain cooperative mm -hmm. so uh couple of things are coming to mind straight away. Uh, the first is this participatory budgeting process that I say we actually, we do engage in in, in Dandelion Collective. Um, it takes up quite a lot of time actually. And like to, to do this, even, it, even amongst the co-op of you know, eight to 10 people, we've been um, around that number for most of the last couple of years. And, um, uh, the DAO tools that I'm familiar with, um, the one I'm most familiar with is DAO House. Uh, participatory budgeting is an absolutely key part of their functionality. The, the possibility for any uh, member of the, the DAO to, to make a proposal, a budgeting proposal, essentially saying, I want this much money to, to do this thing and to allow the other members of that DAO to discuss and, and, and then vote on that proposal um, and then one of the most interesting things about um dow house dows um is, is 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 rage quitting so this is this is something that actually doesn't really have a it doesn't particularly have a parallel in um kind of traditional co-op and participatory budgeting what i'd say which is um essentially the the ability for someone to uh, if, if uh, to relinquish their economic rights in exchange for a proportional amount of of tokens and other assets in the the dow's treasury and the most common time that this is actually used is when a proposal passes which someone doesn't like so like um, i might be uh, most members of the dow might think this is a really great thing to fund we're going you know they vote to fund it and i think that's a terrible use of the dow's funds and like rather than just having to to deal with that there's a there's this like grace period at the end of Dow House proposals where I can choose to to to, to burn my economic shares to relinquish my economic shares um, say if, if I you know if I had 10% of the outstanding economic shares in that Dow I could instead I could re relinquish them for 10% of the assets in the Dow's treasury um, and uh, that is bef before any money gets spent on the proposal that I'm I'm unhappy with right yeah. Um, so that, that um, so there's there's scalability I see with DAOs in the in the participatory budgeting domain, uh, and I would also suggest that they are, are helpful just in context of, of running a global organisation. That it's there are complexities. There would be complexities for people um, else that aren't based in the UK of joining a UK based worker cooperative. And whereas DAOs by being internet native organizations don't care you know about passports or nationality or work permits or whatever like people can be signing up to these things um, wherever they are regardless of, of the situation there and uh so that yeah they're, they're kind of geographically scalable as well as uh scaling scaling in the, the budgeting domain so i want to just just explore these a little bit i mean there might be more because these are kind of points that come up quite a lot around the kind of you know the the, the pro argument and I'm trying to, um, so, so the one is about this, so, so you, it, I mean, in a normal company, I mean, strictly there may be more complexity about how you, um, but I, I can, I can, I could sell my shares. In this case, it's almost that you could design to a company that at any point, a member after some given vote could basically get their, exchange their shares for a proportional value of the treasury. These are things that you could design yeah. quite easily. So I guess the question is, why are they not so common? I mean, this is a point I often have. Um, what, I mean, I think it's a more general point, which is that I've been around in like civic tech and what was called liquid democracy and stuff for now 20 years of people being like, oh, we should have more participatory. And I've been involved in participatory budgeting at the World Bank. I built a platform. I was involved in building platform participatory budgeting. 
And the challenge always has been is like, why don't we have participatory budgeting in our society? Like, why do we have what would be more traditionally called like delegatory or managerial budgeting, which is yes. I elect people and they represent me. And I'm not saying, by the way, I'm not, I'm against, I think there's amazing mm -hmm. things. But I'm trying to say is just for people listening is we need to think through, which is traditionally as an organization gets more complex, be it our government of our state or mm -hmm. even in a classic company, there's sort of specialization that needs to happen. You know, it, it's like if every day I, you know, as a citizen in the UK or something, or in the US or wherever I am, had to be like, okay, are we going to spend money today on, you know, I don't know, the pension? You know, like we, we don't, we can't participate at that level. So we end up delegating. And then this is the sure. issue yeah. that often happens in liquid democracy or even participate through budgeting systems of delegation, that, you know we have this idea, well, then we're going to, what you introduce to address it is delegation. I can give my vote. I'm not going to vote directly. I'm going to delegate it to Stephen. But you're kind of on this direction of like, okay, at some point, Stephen has become our elected representative or expert. Mm -hmm. And we move towards this, or, or he's the appointed CEO or manager, you know, classic in a corporation. The shareholders don't run the corporation day to day. They elect this board who then appoint managers and the managers run it day to day. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of saying that this, this ability to do rage quitting, like, I guess the question I often ask is like, hey, we've had quite a lot of experimentation in organizational design for quite a long time. Is there, why is it that we don't allow that much, you know, rage quitting or why is it most companies don't have that? I mean, one answer I can, we, you know, yeah. we might not go into that, but I would just pose that question. I mean, there might be reasons for that. You know, many companies own more illiquid assets that's harder to fractionalize and therefore to give people back a proportional set of the things. Um, right that um you know that that's that's one quite example but again it seems like a technical detail like it wouldn't be that hard it wouldn't be that hard to fractionalize things and i think the the, the answer that i have mostly and i ask this about DAOs, and I, I would ask it is many entities what they have that's of value is the not the things they hold in their treasury but their what they're up to the enterprise itself the shares in the enterprise itself which you can go sell I mean, I assume often these tokens are tradable. You could go rather than rage quit. You could, I get you can't liquidate assets in the treasury in the same way, but you could just go sell your shares, right? Normally, you know, if I in the company don't like what Apple's doing, I go sell my shares to somebody else who does like what they're doing. Actually, no, like at least with Dow House, Dow's both these, these voting and economic rights, neither of them are transferable. So but okay. that's, you know, that's, kind of, that's kind of a detail, yeah. Yeah, so that's important. So, the, so they're not transferable. Yeah. And so I just kind of coming then to the second one, which is the global point. I mean, please respond. I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to object. I'm just like, what is it that has, what is it that the blockchain allows us to transcend that was an objection before? And the second one is the geographical one, which I think is a really good point. And of course, there's a question, which is why, you know, having been someone who has set up companies in the UK, France, US, uh, even Germany, Estonia, I, I, I'm like, I really, really get the pain, uh, you know, having to fly to Germany or something to shut. You know, I, I've, I've experienced that uh, firsthand. But I guess my question to you is why do we have that friction today? You know, is it just like a, is it like just a bug or is it a feature? And, and, and like, why, why is it hard to create geographic, global, geographically um, agnostic kind of global organizations today with like shares and vote or voting rights and so on? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, on the, the, the first thing that I, I heard you speak to there was um, like, isn't, isn't this stuff like possible using kind of existing participatory budgeting right. systems? Like what, why, what exactly is the benefit of using a, a, a blockchain in, in the yeah. to, to do this stuff? And I guess the, the, the key answer for me would be censorship resistance that especially for a participatory budgeting process the sense that this is like uh you know tr transparent and like provably fair and, and, and uncorrupted is particularly in, important and there are i mean there's actually a very popular increasingly popular um participatory budgeting platform called co-budget which um, was developed by folks in spiral uh, uh but you know in in uh, it's it, it's it runs on some like centralized like SQL database. I imagine it, like in, in principle, some uh, like an employee of CoBudget, or if I knew of someone who worked at CoBudget, could you know tweak the figures like in a way that maybe other people in the process like weren't aware of. And whereas if everything is being done 
on a, on a public blockchain, like everyone can see exactly what's what's going on there. So I would say that actually participatory budgeting processes, um, a one use case where a blockchain is actually potentially quite useful relative to the, the, like the data just being kind of opaque and, and um, yeah. Um, so uh, there's, um, so the, this, this piece around and, and like, delegation and delegating votes like I see that as um actually de desirable in a lot yes, in, yeah, in yeah. lots of ways like I don't have a problem at all about like people de I'd much rather people uh like affect like delegate their vote and just like check in on that delegation like when a particularly important vote comes up or and or kind of every quarter then they're not engaged at all and that and like Absolutely. low participation in DAO processes, including budgeting processes, has been a major challenge. And I think I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the next generation of, of delegation tools and like true liquid democracy systems in DAOs, because it's a lot of that stuff is pretty limited right now. Um, and then, so moving on to this um, geographical point, um, are, so you asked like, are there reasons, or can I so understand, what, 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 I mean, reasons why it's difficult yeah, to what, do this stuff? Can I say, sometimes yeah. people, people I talk to go, oh look, you know, we can build these international things, and I'm like, yeah, and there's a reason, and let me just take one example right now, so let's say you can pay people anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. like, so one of the things you can do in a DAO, which you do in a normal company, is you might, here's a proposal, like let's say Stephen and Rufus and we have formed our Stephen Rufus DAO, mm -hmm. and then we've got a proposal which is to pay Stephen, you know, mm -hmm. we'll put a proposal forward in our participatory budgeting and we vote on it. Um, but how do we pay, you know, we have to pay taxes, right? Payroll taxes um, and so on and so forth. Like one of the reasons that currently today it's a bit complicated doing stuff, you know, building companies in lots of different, you know, di you know, building a company where people participate from all over the world mm -hmm. is because you've got payroll taxes, you've got corporate taxes, you've got a whole bunch of like infrastructure. Now I know there's some part of the, um, I'd say the crypto community that's almost like, that's the point, man. We're gonna, we're gonna <laughs> root around, you know, we're gonna get rid of the state, yeah, we're gonna yeah, get yeah. to the libertarian anarchist with utopia we've always yeah. dreamed of. Um, and, and, and that's a valid point, I think, but you have to think through, okay, well then what would that look like? But, and, may, and maybe that might be a point you might make, but I'm just saying if that isn't a point one would make, and I suspect mm. it might be a bit more nuanced. Sure, yeah. Um, what this kind of thing that people say oh but i can just form a cooperative with anyone from anywhere i'm like yeah but that also means like if i'm not a good cooperative i could form a like a mafia down and like just transfer stuff you know like there's no reason i can't and that's a bit facetious but what i'm trying to get is i can form something and not pay and, and use it to kind of pay people but not comply with any payroll regulation yeah i mean that's, that's certainly not my interest in it no but, no I, but, I must, but, but I, what, what i what i would say here is and I, th I think maybe I touched on this in, in our conversation previously. It's um, it's uh, it, it, at least some some of the ways in which DAOs are interesting to me is is not that they enable like entirely new forms of cooperation. Like yeah, you're like yeah, in principle, you know, you can you can you know fly that person over and they can sign a bit of paper in the UK. And in principle, you could have something like rage quitting and so on. But uh, for for me, DAOs make you know those those kind of things and we could probably name a few others like 10 or 100x yes. simpler and easier and cheaper and more efficient and sometimes like and, and yeah you, well, i think we did, we did speak about this because and, and sometimes when you when things like when things are that much easier and cheaper okay. it does actually enable something very very different i think the example that we gave of like people that you can even there's a you can even find uh like people writing skeptical letters about email being like why do we need email we're like we can send letters you know but actually email is sufficiently faster and cheaper that actually it did change the world and I, I have the same kind of feeling about that so that's a great question when does quality change quantity and in what area right. Right. and i think i mean we're not i think we i want to move as long as we want to get to talk about a few other things but mm. i think that there's a crucial question there to ask so when are technologies transformative and this is one comes up about so this why i was pressing these two areas so one is why I mentioned about liquid democracy, I don't want to go on about it, but what I was trying to call into question is, in my experience, having been involved in such projects quite a lot and being involved with communities who thought they were quite important, was that, that there's, there's kind of a reason you don't have that. And it's not because we don't have the technology or infrastructure to do it in traditional organizations. It's because it turns out to not be that useful. It turns out that people end up delegating. And as delegation happens, you end up with something that looks quite like a traditional corporation in that you have managers, you have this delegated authority, you have a board, you have all of this stuff. And you also have some of the friction 
you know, that happens. You know, there's these famous, you know, things can be very quickly endowed. There's a reason why you have to call a general meeting with a certain amount of notice and not, you know, not do things too quickly in companies. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to go on about it. What I'm trying to get at though, and again, also with the global point was we mm. kind of could today, it's not hard today to let anyone, you know, we, we could pass legislation in the UK and say, look, you can incorporate a company in the UK from anywhere online. We don't need to know anything about you. There's no yeah. know your customer. You can have any shareholders. You can do whatever you want. That's not hard to, to create, but there's mm. a reason states are not creating those things today. And the question I'd kind of ask is why? That What I was trying to get at was more like, hey, is that just because states are afraid, like it's a threat to them and they're just like these kind of, you know, the anarcho capital, the anarcho, you know, libertarian view that states are some, I'm like, no, I think, and I think that's the question that comes to this question, is it transformative? Is the reason that it's, it's currently hard, is there something quite profound about like the nation state? You know, like we did a whole episode about like this guy Balaji and this kind of like the network state and we don't need, mm -hmm. we man, where we're going, we don't need roads. We've got the internet, you know, like we don't need most of the stuff the state did. And that's a really big question because if, if you think that, then yeah, sure. Um, blockchain seems to be like a good, it's like an Uber hack, you know, like Uber hacked the regulatory system. Like it, it wasn't, pro what Uber did was not innovative. Like people for years could be like, yeah, we could build something that has an unregulated taxi service. The point was Uber somehow, the combination of the smartphone, the technology, the demand and the willingness to spend mo a large amount of money on like regulatory lobbying managed let uber do something that was kind of th that wasn't it wasn't that it was inconceivable it was that they broke this kind of like site oligopoly taxi services had where they restricted supply to drive up basically mm -hmm. prices for themselves i, I i'm just kind of saying here it's like hey the, the thing i'm really trying to get at is like this if the state does do things useful and we want to keep it there's a there's then this kind of technological breakthrough is is that really like it's not like we couldn't do it today it's like we're choosing not to do it today because it would undermine functions the state does like taxing and paying unemployment insurance and things like that yeah so um actually some of what you said reminds me of something that's um some of the stuff that matthew green writes in a response to to the the letter you you, you played a part in um, I wonder if I can if I actually just have it right here. He says, may, may, maybe the result won't even be a successful blockchain solutions. Perhaps we'll simply get more and better offerings from the traditional finance industry as they start to wake up to the fact that more open systems can complete with their closed offerings. And I feel something similar about in terms of the state and co-ops. Like if if DAOs uh, uh, if DAOs actually um, themselves like don't take off and people don't end up using blockchains and and but they do push states to invent like way faster and cheaper and easier ways of spinning up companies, particularly like worker cooperatives, in various jurisdictions, then that would still be a good outcome for me. Like I'm I'm not so, I'm not like wedded to the fact you know to, not, to, I'm much more interested in in the, the outcomes than I, I am in like the details of the technology. Um, so. Uh, and, and and the other thing that was coming up was, which links to some of this, the what we were saying about like structure and, and ontology is, um, uh, it's the stuff you were saying more recently about um, like liquid democracy and about how you've seen that actually, maybe it doesn't actually work that well in, in sometimes or, uh, yeah, sure, like DAOs, like co-ops are still really only as good as the people that are working in them and just like, a, a, just because something is is a DAO does not mean that you're gonna you then don't need to think about things like conflict resolution and just and uh, uh, and effective ways of actually like facilitating that participatory budgeting process to ensure everyone feels heard and everyone feels like they've had an adequate um, means of actually like pitching their their proposal and all this this kind of stuff. So um, and and actually increasingly that is the area that I'm much more, well. I'm more interested in it, I could say I think there's um there's been a big there is a big awakening happening in this kind of DAO space of like oh right wow like we really do need all of this expertise that um that's been developed over decades even a century now kind of within the co-op space and and um and, and other people working on decentralized organizing people like the ready and inspiral and so on and I'm very excited to see that, that coming together of, of, of that knowledge. And, um, and, and I also see people that have been working on decentralized organizing 
um, in in co-ops in a traditional way that are also that are sick to the teeth of the bureaucracy of like the existing sort of state apparatus for this stuff and are very excited about just the breath does feel like a breath of fresh air in the sense like you can just click a few buttons and it's there and it's spun up and like we can move tokens around just like that and we don't have to be like paying lawyers thousands of pounds an hour to sign this or do that and uh, so um yeah i think i think there's uh there, i i observe currently a very uh like fruitful coming together of that that like kind of people with legacy um or uh, interest and expertise in decentralized organizing and um, more, more technologically minded folks in that space i really want to draw that because i think that's a really great point Stephen. i think that's a really like uh, several i and it connects to one of my favorite political thinkers like roberto unger which is about kind of the space for institutional innovation so one of the points i think i'm hearing you making is like hey maybe it's too much maybe it's a bit crazy like because right now you can kind of basically set up a corporation with shareholders with no regulatory oversight maybe, maybe you know even if that is too much like maybe maybe it isn't but even if it is too much it's gonna it's giving us a space to play to experiment to innovate and it's putting maybe you could say pressure or, mm -hmm. or in a better sense even inspiration yeah. for the more traditional actors the state to innovate a bit in mm -hmm. around what would be possible yeah. um and i think that's a really great point i think that's one of the strongest arguments one could make there is to say listen you know it, yeah okay maybe it's like it's just like you don't have any rules so you can do anything but that's maybe a good thing and that we have a space for that to happen a space for that that kind of play to happen um and I think I think that's a very you know a very interesting point and a very uh, a powerful point there about about that. Um, I mean I think I think the one question I'm just reflecting for myself, and this is like a deep point. We don't need to go into it so much because it will. It's the thing that I guess that I think about that sometimes though is it also reflects something about our era, which is that the way that we're going to get even what I would call basically political or institutional innovation is not through traditional politics, not through participation in the traditional mm. sense in part, whether in party politics or just movement, it's going to be, we're going to go off and like do some technology innovation and it will enable mm. kind of stuff. It's like my joke about Uber. Uber is mainly an institutional hack dressed yeah. up as a technological innovation. Like you could, yeah, I mean, okay, it's a bit better. You can order it on your phone. I get, we can get into the details of it, but it's mainly, um, kind of an institutional innovation yeah and it, it's interesting to me because that's the one uh and this is a, like a longer episode but i see it in effective altruism which is by the way very connected with the 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 crypto and blockchain community which is this sort of pessimism about traditional collective action mm -hmm. and therefore an investment in this other route and my mm -hmm. always joke about mm -hmm. this is like lord of the rings i don't mean you know, lord of the rings you know, they're going to go over the mountain and like there's the snow and like Soren's opposing them. They're like, okay, we're going to go through the mountain. There's a shortcut, you know, and of course it goes pretty badly wrong. You know, there's the Balrog and, you know, they, you know, and I always go like, oh, there's this temptation we have, like, oh, traditional politics is boring and slow. You know, the long march of the institutions is ineffective. So, yeah. and I think there's value in that. I'm not saying it's wrong. The danger of it is that, and I think you are alluding to the end, is it can tempt people to think that this shortcut is really like if, if you see it as like oh this is a useful tactic in the ongoing effort to transform ourselves transform our society to build more um participatory more egalitarian mm -hmm. structures but, but more, more kind of culture of uh it, it being in our in our work in our personal lives in our societies if you see it as one like okay this is a useful hack or a useful experiment mm -hmm. but it's when it becomes like this is the solution and like oh let's like oh we give up on this other area mm -hmm. that's that's for me and i think you're not saying that at all and you're saying like one of the things that's happening right now is this awakening in the dow space and the crypto space which i think really exciting of like okay we've got these interesting technology and these interesting structures but we now need the being we now need yeah. the practices we now need the interpersonal skills mm -hmm. we now need the learning from these other communities um you know, because sometimes I'd say a lack of humility. There's like, oh, we're just, mm -hmm. hey, we, <laughs> like, um, yeah, but yeah. that's really exciting. And so let's maybe talk. You talk. You want to talk a little bit about a few projects that excite you. Um, I mean, obviously, the very do, work do, you're do, doing. Do, just first, first, if I may, like I think yeah, this. Please, please. Um, yeah, this is a very. Uh, 
uh, interesting topic for me because I, I so as I, I think you maybe mentioned some of this at the beginning didn't you like I was a board member of Greenpeace UK I worked very much in the kind of traditional like change making sector for New Economics Foundation Living Wage, Living Wage Foundation 350.org I was selected as the the Green Party candidate for Totnes the last uh, general election before the Green Party decided to stand down candidates nationwide as part of the kind of um, the, uh, Brexit agreement with the Liberal Democrats so like I've, uh, yeah, I've been, in, been very interested and engaged in the past with, with mainstream politics. And at this point, uh, and another one I mentioned actually is the Psychedelic Society that really started as uh, a campaign, a campaign for the legal regulation of psychedelic medicines in the UK, which was focused on like lobbying the, the, the drugs minister at the time. And there's no doubt that I am incredibly disillusioned <laughs> with the with the mainstream political system and like the potential for change there. Like my the a, you know my a summary of my experience over those, those years was like you know well intentioned like but ultimately like banging my head against the brick wall of, of the, the like the kind of power structures in 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 British society and so. Um, yeah, I do see my current like in engagement and uh, in, with the crypto space as, uh, as being informed by that, if you like. And it feel it does feel like like just a real breath of fresh air and just a relief of like, thank fuck, I don't have to be just like writing letters to people that don't want to hear from me and like signing petitions on things that they don't care about and all the rest of it. And, um and even you no know, to the extent of or actually like march you know, marching and like taking action with groups like extinction rebellion getting arrested like i'm just like yeah i did I, it wasn't working as far as i could tell and like and this at least seems like just a totally different tactic you know what a, ta yeah. a, a tactic that was just not even possible before the advent of this technology if you liked uh, um maybe you know you maybe you could take issue with that a little bit but like um but yeah i, li I like that kind of tactical lens that you, you offered there for sure i think that's or i think it's just because it is so powerful your share because i just want to acknowledge you i mean like in both these areas just the commitment and that you've had like and the fact the two things the vision like the, like the aspiration i don't mean like but the the the, the the commitment to make and then the commitment to make a difference and actually doing stuff you know and I, I i think this is really profound because i think that you you also like it's kind of we want both and at some point i also think i did a lot of political work and believe me i, I you know i really understand and my joke was about that it's like an avalanche but one even that might not even happen in your freaking lifetime you know it's like yes that's the problem but you know well i think what is it the phrase of like you know sometimes um you know what 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 should take minutes takes years and then you know whole whole years can happen in minutes in politics you know like mm -hmm. there's this kind of mm -hmm. moment of waiting and waiting and waiting and then suddenly the revolution comes mm -hmm. again by the way to talk to Unger who uh, I've just been reading again you know he's one of his points is one of the things he, he's kind of fed up with is tradition we've had to wait for crises we've had to wait for some significant breakdown mm -hmm. in the social and economic system to have moments of profound change or reform mm. and that that might condemn one to a whole lifetime of nothing of, of nothing happening and here's the, one of his things why can't we have more radicalism in the everyday and, and you know why can't we institute it? i just want to come to you because i think that disillusionment that and in any way even we come to a cynicism you know i talked to the klima dao folks and this was it's like kind of it's like they were kind of like it's just not because when you came down to it, klima dao if i'm being a bit harsh but it's just like it's not really doing much like it's basically a market making for buying carbon offsets mm -hmm. which yeah i get it but it's like i mean you kind of sound like gordon gecko a bit you know it's like hey you know we're gonna make we're gonna make trading something better and that's gonna solve the climate crisis i'm like hey the fundamental thing is we have to stop emitting carbon you know like you know not just to, yeah, to buy yeah. carbon offsets. and i'm not saying they didn't disagree like these were people who talking to them really good mm -hmm. faith had come from a background often in years of some of climate activism or at least you know climate training or other <laughs> stuff and we're just like but it's hopeless you know extinction rebellion is not going to work and i always the one thing i always want to say so first of all just such empathy and love and like wow i really acknowledge you and i think it's great that you go some we go somewhere different and we play we play in different areas and the biggest trick the devil ever pulled was fading you didn't exist the biggest trick that neoliberal capitalism and the American NRI Prize Institute ever pulled was persuading you 
that politics was hopeless and boring and couldn't make a difference. Because when we check out, and this is me going a bit, when we give up on that collective action, and it doesn't mean traditional party politics, there are many routes that are other than that, but particularly when we give up on the, the idea of collective political action, which to some extent is built into these techno-libertarian visions, which we kind of do it ourselves. Um, when you give up on that, you kind of cede it to the other side. You cede it to some, because the thing is, we can do it. Now, we may not, and I share, you know, I think it's just anyone who looks at the climate crisis honestly right now, or in many other areas, has to just be like, you know, you have to be shaken, you have to be, you have to be mourning, you have, there has to be some kind of even grief in that. Um, and, you know, we've got to find some way to renew our hope. And what I hear in one way, which is great, is this is one area you're renewing your hope. This is one area where you get to, we get to innovate, we get to create, we get to do something we get to experiment with, you know, radical and better forms of institutional organization, egalitarianism. And for you, in a way, it doesn't really matter whether it's crypto or whatever, it's just, but there's some space where we can innovate and create in that way, uh, in that sense. And I think that's, in that yeah, way- Yeah, exactly, but it's rather, rather than just feel like we're fighting against something, which there's a yeah. Bucky, Bucky Filler quote, isn't there? It's like, you know, like, it's, it's, it's not about fighting the existing system, it's great, it's about creating a new system that makes the old one obsolete, which is the, yeah. you know, the kind of the, the, the philosophy which I, you know, I bring to some of my work in this space. Yeah. And just to say, and, I mean, I certainly, um, you, you, you started talking about not giving up on political action, then you said it actually, you, know, you reframed it to collective action. Absolutely, I absolutely haven't given up on collective action. You know, like I see worker co-ops and, and, and DAOs as, a, as, as I kind of interpret as, at least potentially super scalable form of multi-stakeholder co-ops as like a, a, a super interesting form of collective action and in some uh, like you know economic collective action actually um, securing like a decent livelihood for for our peers um, and in a in a way that is ontologically quite different requires actually a different way of, of being with with one another. Um, and it, and actually this this kind of economic collective action like, and just how we work together how um is um is, feels much more meaningful to me in many ways than, than political collective action which um and uh so another thing that's surviving i think i think it's that there's a chomsky quote around um uh, about growing the floor of the cage that I've interpreted in the context of like worker cops. So actually, I do think they are potentially a very like very radical institution. Like the fact that worker cops simply can't you know exist, do exist, even in small part, like in the amidst this sea of capitalism, I think it is is fascinating and and something that um, I I'm very I, I'm very passionate about seeing and in, inspiring like more. People to come together to to work in this way with um, you know with with dandelion collective is just one small example but yeah it's you you can do it it is it is possible there there are plenty of other examples out there like Mondragon that you're probably familiar with is a worker cop in in Spain isn't it of like the best country mainly of wow. tens of thousands of employees or maybe hundreds of even maybe yeah so um, and uh, like what like why not what what, what why what, what is are the, what are the could could we could we worker co-opify the economy which or if you, and to the extent to which you think that was a part of the solution kind of like daoify the economy so that people are actually kind of self-organizing um uh, in these economic units for, for 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 mutual benefit and 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 this is not this has not been lost on the political class actually like jeremy corbyn's team had some like very interesting solutions to to promote uh, worker cooperatives, I think, in, in, the, man in the, the manifesto of the last election. So, like, there's a there, there's some awareness of of this um, this this form of organisation, but uh, uh, and and I would love I would love there to be more. I hope I hope the worker carps and DAOs are are, are you know are, are something that we are reading about in in manifestos at the next general election. Well, I want to then come to you because that's you said. What would it take? I think that's an incredible vision which is we want to have a more democratic um, economy and more participatory. And you mentioned, I want to loop us all the way back. So one of the things it would take, you were mentioning, is some kind of inner growth, some kind of consciousness mm -hmm. for them to function well. So could, you, could we talk a little bit about that? At maybe, mm -hmm. you know, kind of ending. It's like, what, what would it take in our society? What would it, what do you and you know just maybe concrete other people you've like just like it hasn't like the cop hasn't worked people are like oh 
you know, and, and I don't know to who they are, but you know, what is it? <laughs> what what was it that like you know that was the struggle for them, and what would they be the growth that they that someone might need, and how do we support that? You know, whether it's go even into the crypto space, because one of the points is what would you know what 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 would we be advising people who do want to really be doing good work there? Like, what is the ontological work? If you use that term, what's the consciousness work? What's the inner work? What's the yeah. um, practices that people need to be looking at here yeah. you know if you wanted to think let talk a little bit about that yeah sure so i think there's uh two levels that are important to contemplate um like yeah. the individual and the the collective at least and there's work that can be done at, at both scales um for the individual, and I'm, I'm actually looking now at some of the at, at the draft syllabus for uh, for a course I might be running in collaboration with with Gitcoin. Um, uh, I think there's an an important piece around uh, purpose. Each each individual contemplating why I'm actually here, like what what difference do I want to make in in the world, and, and how and how do I fit in uh, and to, is my experience that bringing some you know devoting some time to that bring some conscious attention to that can be enormously productive uh, there are practices of psychotherapy counseling coaching mentoring uh, that um, that can just help us yeah develop that that greater um, awareness of ourselves our, our hopes and our dreams is more the kind of the focus of, of, of coaching side of things or just coming to terms with with our past if, if on, more on the psychotherapeutic side of things uh embodiment meditation and, and breath work i think i mean like to can you say on. a little bit though those are practices what is it that has people though so let's say we have this dream for our society yeah what would it you know this is kind of argument let me give you the analogy of sometimes education so people say oh you know education could be much more much more whole child it could be much more you know open and then people say well look one of the reasons education the way it is you know there's a kind of cynical it's, it's producing good workers for the capitalist system but it could also be like okay it's working with whatever it's like a lowest common denominator you know you've got kids there who you know aren't getting you know i don't know aren't don't have secure attachment aren't being looked after at home the system mm -hmm. has just to work with everyone and it ends up with mm -hmm. this lowest common denominator of like a regimented room do your lesson sort of thing so i'm kind of intrigued in, in, in also the for those things even those practices be taken on you mentioned there's some of the people who have the work up they struggled with it you know and maybe not struggled like oh they couldn't do it but like they've gone to a more traditional organization or something like that. what what is it that you think because i'm fascinated by that question what has it that people who are drawn towards this what is it Oh, and what is it they need to take on? What do they need to be willing to do to get all the amazing benefits, but to kind of, what is it that, that gets in people's way um, in doing the ontological work, doing the consciousness work, doing the inner work? Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm still not totally sure what you're getting about this question, but I mean, but, but the answer that comes to mind is what primarily, primarily gets in people's ways themselves. <laughs> and it's like, so, the, the, so to actually engage in that work of, some kind of psychotherapeutic practice of developing like uh, a consistent meditation practice like this is uh this is of interest to the co-op you know this is something we would we we, we start every meeting with the check-in and like that might be coming that might come up like oh i had a great you know meditation this morning or i had a great session with my therapy oh, we, we're interested in this we we very inspired by the work of frederick lelou and reinventing organizations one of his three principles of teal organizing is, is wholeness of bringing our whole selves to work and so um and it's you know it's not that isn't really uh, when i think of it in this context you know it's not just for the sake of the individual to feel like they're being you know seen and heard in their wholeness it's actually kind of for the sake of the organization to like feel that that person is interested in developing <laughs> their own wholeness like because uh, um, to have individuals that are that are yeah they're you know working through or have worked through past trauma that, that do have like a grounding practices of, of one form or another these are things that in my experience working in a work are pretty essential and then the individuals that like haven't taken on that work and, and don't have those those like foundational practices are <laughs> difficult to work with you know and, and like and we will spend a disproportionate number of time doing conflict resolution processes with that individual or like having to like get into um devote time in other ways that uh to them and there might come a point to feeling that 
uh, you know, we it's the actually the better the investment that needs to happen here is not it's or the better investment would be this, this individual investing in themselves as a way of then reducing the time time that we're then investing in, in any kind of resolution processes after. I will say that we have we have like a period of one year, uh, like a one year period that you have to work with the cop before you actually become a member. That's so this, this yeah. is this is when this is when this is happening. Like we're not um and we get a chance to to feed back to that individual like yeah you know we think there's we think you could be a really good member of this organization but you know maybe you you would like to try you know developing that regular meditation practice or like contemplating you know speaking to a coach or whatever whatever it might be so there's a there's a domain of like of of like individual practice and and then there is this other domain of yeah of 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 group practices so it's there's a certain skill to um well to participate in meetings effectively facilitating meetings in, indeed as as well like we we take turns facilitating meetings and that's something that is often quite scary to, to people that are just you know coming into the organization um for the first time um and but we encourage people to kind of get used to that as as soon as possible um uh maybe i'll pause there to see if i'm you know well, along the right lines yeah Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I think that was great. And I, what I, I mean, what I heard was this willingness to grow. So the, I call it in an organization, I, I've written playbooks. What well, one is this, bring the whole person, but this coachability, even from yourself, doesn't necessarily mean coaching someone, but this willingness to kind of the growth mindset, the willingness mm -hmm. to be interested in growth, to realize we can yeah. grow, and including dealing with the challenging things that may come up when we when we seek to grow is kind of essential. It's one. It's kind of the if you can't, if you're not willing to coach, the pro, if you're not willing to be coached, you're not willing to grow, you can't, you know, it's like you're kind of stuck in a certain way. It, it's kind of this meta feature. Um, and I hear that. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, we're going to, we will run out. I think for me, this, it's great. We've talked about here a lot about Web3 and crypto, but even bigger points, which is how do we create society that nurtures maybe the safety and security for people that they feel that space? Because obviously part of that ability to be able to grow, whether we, you know, that comes from, secure attachment love acceptance secure, you know maybe economic and and kind of emotional security and so on and how do we build societies that support that because in that bigger vision that you were sharing i think that's so exciting and how do we how do we see a you know a transformed economy and not transformed because we produce more but because the being that we create the and the experience that we have at work is transformed that right. we have this yeah. much uh, more rewarding connected uh, participatory uh, form of, of, of working that's really absolutely important. that's that's what economic growth looks like to me yeah. <laughs> growth, growth in all of those things not just exactly. like you know gr growth in in gdp of course much of which is it, nowadays is defensive spending and spending more as a consequence just to stop things getting worse yeah yeah exactly exactly so i think that's I think that's beautiful i think we are at a good moment so anything last you'd like to say before we complete for today any last words or we I know people can find you online. I think at Stephen Reed, is it .net? Uh, That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's been a... Earth at the Danline Collective. Um, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, and I think it's been a, a great conversation, and and certainly uh, co-ops are uh, a, 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 and one of the areas that I'm most. Um, or one of the reasons why I'm most excited about the blockchain and, and DAO space. And I'm looking forward to seeing like further dialogue between those, those different sectors in the, the weeks and months ahead. And thank you, Rufus, for all of your excellent work in this area and just the, yeah, the in, fantastically intelligent conversations that you're facilitating around these topics. That's very generous of you. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you to the listeners. Uh, you can find more of this at web3.lifeitself.us. Uh, thanks from Stephen and me, and until next time.